Chapter 41 Questions and Answers Enlightenment Question. Could you define the word enlightenment? Everybody talks about it, but no one defines it. Answer. Like the words love and spiritual, this is another lofty term that's been watered down by misuse and overuse, and frankly, sloppy use. Etymologically, it simply means a state of having light within, which indicates a condition of brightness, glowing, or shining. Of course, it points to a spiritual achievement, but I've heard the term used to mean everything from a basic recognition of soul to perfect self-realization and union with God. To get a better idea of the spiritual path, it's a good exercise to clarify the goal. And essentially, enlightenment is our goal. So why all the confusion? Well, I don't think that it's any great mystery. Spiritual teachers, like everyone else, are all at different levels of soul maturity. Likewise, their teachings are often aimed at different goals. An E.T. walk-in who claims to channel the Pleiadians may bring a message of world peace. For him or her, enlightenment means taking care of the earth. Another teacher offers sacred geometry and Merkaba meditation. For them, the goal is to awaken the light body, whatever that means. The specific use of the word enlightenment usually depends on what that particular speaker considers important. In more traditional approaches, a Hindu guru will point us toward God consciousness. A Tibetan Buddhist seeks to uncover luminous mind and total spacious awareness devoid of ego. Accordingly, each has a somewhat different idea of enlightenment, yet their differences can be reconciled. To make that reconciliation, the first thing to note is that the ultimate goal of soul evolution can be described in a multitude of ways, and there are also specific levels of attainment, which are also described in numerous ways. Specifically, different traditions use different paradigms with more or less conceptual rigidity. Some mystics call the absolute a plenum, or fullness, while others call it a void, meaning emptiness. And so, God can be described as greater than great and smaller than small. At the summit of soul evolution, a peak beyond conception, we've developed an awareness that has unified all apparent opposites. The Creator is both imminent and transcendent, in all and beyond all. So too, enlightenment, both obvious and subtle, it's the realization of total unity, and more. Furthermore, each teacher in every tradition, regardless of their language system, is also at a different level of being, as Ra would say, worth more or less distortion to the law of one. Each teacher is a soul with their own unique development of body-mind-spirit, with more or less purification of their personality and self-based desires, expressing some particular degree of fusion with higher self and seven-chakra evolution. Again, there are grades of self-realization, achievement, and enlightenment. Personally, I prefer to use the term enlightenment for the apex of evolution, the fullest development of energy and consciousness, total seven chakra completion, the final release from all need for incarnation in all seven dimensions of our system, a state of Buddha or Avatara. All prior achievements have their value and use, of course, but let's not minimize the goal. In such a completed state, A. The limitless light of God pours cosmic energy through us, which comes from Hebrew Kabbalah. B. Body-mind-spirit joins intelligent infinity, from the raw material. C. We live in Satchitananda, which is from Hindu Sanskrit, being consciousness bliss. And D. There's only Nirvana, or Nibban, from the Buddhist, extinction of the flame of grasping at conditioned becoming. Thus, full enlightenment is the end of evolution as we know it. In metaphysical terms, it is fusion with the solar logos and the beginning of the path back to what is called the central spiritual sun, or a galactic logos, which is the source of our sun. Clearly, it's no small matter. Walking the path, greeting countless distortions and catalysts, it's quite helpful to remember where we're going. Yet, in truth, there is nowhere to go. Enlightenment is full being here now. Dharma and Karma. Question. What's the difference between Dharma and Karma? I don't know exactly what they mean. Answer. Both terms come from the Indian Sanskrit, and both of them are used by Hindus and Buddhists in a variety of ways. Some people joke that, my karma ran over my Dharma, meaning they've been overwhelmed by their stuff. And in some ways, the pun stems from a real antithesis between these two forces 
and how they interact on the personal path of evolution. As far as I am aware, Dharma was originally used in a somewhat governmental legislative sense and referred to that which is so decreed, presumably by the old Indian royalty. Thus, it also means the law or truth or way. This meaning is similar to the Chinese word Tao, which is the basis for the Taoist school and the famous text by the sage Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching, also called the way and its power. In this usage, Tao refers to the mysterious primal principle of the universe, the effortless way things are, the way the universe continues in its natural flow. Westerners might call it the mind of God. As is common in old cultures, the ancients derived their inspiration from a close observation of nature and inner recognition of universal principles. Beginning with a clear vision of the way things are, they progressed to the understanding that human beings do best when living in conformity with the principles of life. Not surprisingly, Dharma and Tao can also be used in a strictly ethical sense. For Hindus, Dharma refers to that which is virtuous, justice, harmony, and righteousness. For Buddhists, it's one of the three jewels at the very core of the tradition, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, or community. In this case, Dharma means scriptures and all basic teachings, from the historical Buddha down to all the enlightened teachers who followed the way he set forth. When applied to the individual, Dharma also means duty, obligation, and responsibility. Hindu teachers often counsel their students to do your Dharma, advising them to fulfill their obligations, whatever they may be. According to this view, the proper fulfillment of one's duties is one form of ethical, virtuous behavior, which also involves acceptance of one's own individual karma, or required life experiences. And so, dharma as virtue later became dharma as deed. Fulfilling our fate, or establishing harmony between the practical and the ideal, is considered the way of virtue. Metaphysically, it's also sound policy. Since all life circumstances represent specific forms of catalyst for our own individual evolution, offering us self-tailored conditions in which specific learnings may be achieved, fulfilling our true obligations does move us along the spiritual path. It's a matter of knowing, accepting, and meeting our essential needs for continued self-growth. When we then look at karma, we're talking about the inertial causal weight of our previous imbalanced actions at all levels of body, mind, spirit. In Buddhism, the root cause of karma is considered to be ignorance, stemming from our belief in the apparently solid sense of self and ego. This leads us to grasping, craving, and thirsting for self-defined experience, seeking the pleasant, rejecting what is not. From such basic tendencies, we lead ourselves into all sorts of confusion, or as Ra would say, distortions to the law of one. Any action devoid of love or done without full appreciation of the all-sacred unity of each moment's experience creates some sort of karma, heavy or light. Most karma is generated by energy blockages in the first three chakras, at the levels of body, emotions, intellect, and social interaction. And their healing is affected by the fourth center, the heart. Bringing unconditional acceptance, love, and compassion to our own experience helps clear personal karma and leads us to greater appreciation of real unity, which is achieved by contact with higher self, or awakening of the sixth center, the brow center, or third eye, sixth chakra. If by doing your dharma you're following the true laws of your own being, which just so happen to be synonymous with the laws of the universe, then karma will slowly exhaust. While karma represents our personal distortions that are grist for the mill, learning to follow our dharma is the milling process itself and shifting the balance from the former to the latter, from karmic bondage to dharmic freedom, is no less than progress to infinity. About the chakras. Question. Can you explain the chakras, or subtle energy points, in a simple way? Answer. The word chakra comes from the Indian Sanskrit, in which it simply means wheel. In relation to metaphysics, or ageless wisdom, the chakras can be considered nodal energy points in the human subtle anatomy and they're important for understanding self-growth and healing, the spiritual path, and cosmic plan. While there are many different presentations of the centers, I prefer a seven-center model, which correlates to a seven-ray color spectrum, such as you would find when white light is passed through a prism. The seven light rays also correlate to a seven-density model of cosmic evolution. 
The first step to understanding the centers is to realize that the human being is an energy system or body, mind, spirit complex, guided through evolution by a higher self, also called Christ consciousness or an oversoul. We are a composite of different types of energy, and our energy of consciousness reflects the quality of the energies that we access. We can operate from an infinite array of forces, which accounts for the variation in people and which also provides our catalyst for further learning. Regarding the chakras, the path of spiritual growth requires us to unblock, balance, fully activate, and then utilize these energies according to higher will and purpose. Direct work on the chakras is done primarily through work in consciousness, which is also called working on yourself. Importantly, this means that we can work on the centers without doing special breathing and visualization exercises, often associated with Hindu kundalini or pranayama yoga schools. When the ancient Greeks admonished us to know thyself, they understood that since self is an open system with free access to divine energy, knowing ourselves as we truly are leads to conscious reunion with the Absolute. In their teachings, Ra also summarized the path this way. Know yourself, accept yourself, become the creator. While most mystic systems divide the chakras into higher and lower, such as the three centers below and the four centers above the physical diaphragm, it's important to realize that all seven are essential to full enlightenment and need to be developed in balance. Of course, achieving physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual balance is much harder than it sounds. It's usually the work of eons and many lifetimes. The three centers below the diaphragm pertain to our normal sense of personality, physical vigor and anchoring at the root chakra, emotional life and ordinary self-consciousness at the navel center, and power relations with individuals and groups at the solar plexus. As is often stressed in the teachings of theosophy, this trio is the common point of development for most human souls, and it's the starting point for 3D life on Earth, normal personality identification. Our global transformation and the function of the impending new age is simply an opportunity for souls to move more fully into the next chakra, the fourth or heart chakra, which expresses loving kindness. Therefore, most spiritual people on earth are interested in learning how to heal themselves, and most teachers offer the wisdom of self-acceptance, love, and peace. Taking care of ourselves in this way, we actually clear and unblock the first three centers, allowing more energy to pass into and through the fourth center, all going to the heart, the key to universal service. For most souls, heart development is the platform from which all further growth proceeds. At the fifth center, the level of throat chakra, we perfect pure wisdom, clarity, and the ability to hear, speak, and know truth. From such activation, our opportunities for service increase dramatically. At the sixth center, the so-called third eye, we learn to embody a sense of being in non-duality, peace and forgiveness, will and still presence. Here we contact higher self directly, and as you may know, Formal meditation is the best way to activate this sixth chakra. Finally, at the seventh or crown center, we come to realize our ever-present perfection in full flower, which is, however, accessed through higher self or from the sixth center. This bridging, sixth to seventh chakras, represents a metaphysical gateway from unity to forever, accessing in-streaming infinite mind and energy, bringing the soul omniscience and omnipotence. Interestingly, most Buddhist schools do not deal with the chakras whatsoever, even though their goal is also full enlightenment. This is because all seven centers can be developed through meditation, virtue, and disciplined self-understanding, a path of greater awareness and the disciplined use of will. However, the seven centers are a very useful map that reveals the cosmic blueprint for the return of light to light. Meditation Question, what is the best form of meditation? Answer. On my travels around the world, I've met many people who say that they're doing some kind of meditation. However, when I ask them to explain exactly what they're doing, I usually find that almost no one has a disciplined practice with a clearly defined technique. Most people are using meditation for relaxation or journeying for information. In Buddhist and Hindu yogic traditions, meditation is a formal practice of concentration, one-pointedness, and insight into the nature of mind, self, and reality. In the long run, it does lead to relaxation, but it goes a lot further than that. 
Essentially, it's a path to liberation from rebirth, ignorance, and all personal suffering. Frankly, there is no one best technique, and there are countless practices from all world traditions that are suitable for different personality types. There are moving forms such as Tai Chi or Sufi dancing, seated forms such as Zazen or Raja Yoga, and meditations on breath, sound, imagery, the Guru, or some kind of ritual. It's best to seek the guidance of a genuine teacher from a tradition with which you feel some affinity. The bottom line is this: it must be a practice that leads to greater peace, clarity, self-understanding, and compassion. It should help you develop a greater sense of will, strength, confidence, self-integration, and willingness to be of service to others. If so, then your practice is right on track. Meditation side effects. Question. Could you explain the possible dangerous side effects of excessive meditation? Could you explain how someone who meditates can become as messed up as one man I know, who is a full-blown alcoholic who continually gets arrested? Answer: I have seen more than a few Buddhist teachers, particularly in the Zen school, but also Tibetans, Hindu, and American leaders, who seem to show quite serious personality imbalances. Assuming that they've all spent many years in meditation, it's obvious that meditation does not guarantee perfection. For those who heap praise on the virtues of meditation, including myself, this is a sobering thought. One may have magic powers and tremendous teaching ability, but for some, quote, their life does not equal their work. End quote. They may even help others a lot, yet still have deep emotional blockages. Usually related to the first three chakras or energy centers, as explained above. Christians who praise the grace of divine redemption have an old saying: "The greater the sinner, the greater the saint," which is certainly true. But there's also a more esoteric principle at work here, which is the power of will. Great sinners and great saints both have a well-developed will, and in spiritual science, will is considered the primary active force of higher self or sixth chakra. For better or worse, this will is beyond polarity, and so it may be used with or without love. And I recommend you reflect on that statement. For those on the positive path, such as great saints, their will empowers love. But for those on the negative path, such as some ETs and some so-called black magicians, the will empowers control. When the will is accessed through meditation by those who seek to heal, but are themselves still wounded and emotionally blocked. It may inadvertently wound both self and other. This neutrality of will means that even those who quote do evil have some access to universal power. It's the same will that can be used to become a great saint. All greatness depends on will. In reverse, a great teacher may also fall quite far, which indicates a mistaken or non-loving use of will. As the will strengthens, it becomes more difficult to guard oneself against such mistaken use. This is usually the root of all such teacher scandals, and it simply means that meditation is not enough. Meditation primarily develops the sixth chakra, and can then open a gateway to even greater power. As this energy floods into the personality, it affects all other centers. When there is still significant blockage in the first three centers or chakras. At the base of the spine, the sacral navel point, and solar plexus centers, then all patterns of thought, feeling, and behavior associated with those centers are then energized. Some adepts become even more distorted after intensive meditation, and I had a close friend who temporarily became psychotic after intensive practice in the Japanese Zen tradition. Another friend and Zen colleague ended up killing himself, primarily for this reason. All mystic traditions stress the importance of virtue and self-purification before allowing their students to jump into deeper meditation. Otherwise, what we call unresolved personality issues can become monstrous problems, far greater than they had been, with tremendous potential for harming everyone in the vicinity. This is probably what happened to the man you refer to in your question. So, meditation is not a substitute for careful self-reflection and awareness of your own personality patterns, which need to be expressed, if not in action, then at least in thought, at least to yourself, and then integrated into all our relations. While I believe the higher centers cannot be fully developed without meditation, 
the lower or personality centers having to do with body, emotions, and mental force cannot be totally healed using only meditation. As always, balance and moderation in all things is essential before we delve into serious practice. True meditation is a full-fledged opening to infinite cosmic power, and unless we keep harmlessness and true balance, the fire will surely burn us. Emotional Resistance Question. Sometimes when I really need to do something for my growth, I feel tremendous resistance. What can I do about it? Answer. Resistance is something that we all experience at various points in life, at various stages of the spiritual path. It comes in all varieties, such as strong paralyzing fear, or a vague sense of apathy, or chronic distractedness that scatters intention to the wind. Although I might concur with the recommendation of one American guru to his resistant student, to whom he said, just hit it with a stick, end quote, using a rather crude approach, one approach does not fit all temperaments, and the matter is much more complex if we take the time to look into it. The first thing to consider, of course, is exactly what it is that we are avoiding. In some cases, we resist things that are, for us, in fact, forcing ourselves to do. If someone asked you if you really, in your heart of hearts, want to do that which you are avoiding, you might discover that you're not really sure you want to do it at all. You only think you should. Often, we think ourselves into such a bind by comparing our conduct to that of other people. He meditates, so I guess I should too, or she has her own business, so why shouldn't I? Or they go to workshops, why not me? This kind of thinking tends to override our own desires, which may indeed be less spiritually inclined, such as staying home to watch TV, and also sets up a good-bad psychic struggle. Feeling resistance to forcing ourselves to do what we don't really want to do at an emotional level is no surprise. But what about the benefits that we presume will come from forcing ourselves to do the good things that others are doing? Well, some value may come of it, but I can assure you that you will face the same resistance time and again until you give equal time to the less elevated desires that are being overlooked. It's important to realize that sometimes these apparently less growthful activities, such as resting or for recreation, indulgence, or diversion, are just what is needed. They may provide balance as we strive in other areas, free up mental space for deeper integration, play out old fantasies to later be cleared, or make some time for self-communion. There are often subtle unseen needs standing behind these less holy pursuits. What seems a road to weakness may in fact be the plains of ease. And in other cases, we simply need time off. If we scratch the surface, we may discover deeper issues at work here. For wanderers and lightworkers, resistance to spiritually uplifting activities often comes from world weariness and fatigue. We may have a sense that enough is enough. I'm tired of making more effort. Of course, this can also proceed into a downward spiral of total futility and painful longing to get it all over with, i.e., let me go home. I have met people all over the world with such a view, and many of them are rooting for a quick and thorough pole shift. This type of analysis strikes an important chord, however. By not forcing ourselves to do what we think we should do, we allow hidden desires to rise into awareness. Following a line of least resistance, we may find a virgin ground, the realm of what we really want, which may, however, be disconcerting to admit. How do you live on earth after you acknowledge your main desire is to get the hell out of here? How do you consider and continue the ascending path of meditation, service, and inner work, which definitely demands discipline, after realizing you're not really sure if your heart is in it? How do you maintain diligent self-reflection when you're tired of gazing into dusty mirrors? Certainly, there are no easy answers, and each of us must find our own version of the pathless path of effortless effort. As the Buddha once said, neither tense nor slack. The main point here is that resistance often covers hidden desires and deeper self-conditions, and taking a sledgehammer approach dulls the fine edge of thorough self-recognition. We do well to recall that the path is eternal and demands no hurry at all though there are certainly deadlines in particular lifetimes. In the end, only what is real remains, 
And over time, all of our so-called lesser desires, such as sleep, sex, addiction, distraction, indulgence, and self-pity, will surely be transformed to higher desires for evolution, service, constant learning, and enlightenment. Embracing our resistance and listening hard may not be fashionable, but it is essential for whole self-revelation. On depression and dejection. Question. I sometimes feel real depressed about life, not just my own, but also the way things are in the world around me. Do you have any advice? Answer. Dejection, discouragement, and disappointment are some of the most common experiences of ET wanderers and those with an open heart. Being sensitive to our own process, trying to work on ourselves day by day, it's absolutely certain we'll feel the conditions of the people around us. Since Earth is a most troubled planet, it is inevitable that periodically those troubles will overwhelm us. As Ra said, wanderers can also be called brothers and sisters of sorrow, coming to Earth in response to human sorrow. And then, once we're here, there's no way to avoid that pain if we keep our hearts open. Open hearts are open to everything. However, there is a difference between dejection and depression. If you feel like life is hopeless, the world is doomed, your existence is worthless, and the universe is punishing and fickle, then you've landed in a deeper pit than mere discouragement. There is an important distinction here. While feelings of discouragement are usually a temporary result of emotional overwhelm associated with specific events and conditions, such as your typical burnout, the state of depression is longer lasting, and really comes from a generalized despair that grows from deeper distorted beliefs about ourselves and the world and the universe. To be honest, discouragement is just part of the landscape, and all souls who are sensitive, open, and caring go through such twilight zones on earth. In a world of sorrow, conflict, and ignorance, periodic disappointment is normal and should be expected. Hey, there's a good cause for it. But dropping into a pit of depression, however, is not inevitable. If you feel this kind of sullen gloom, then you really should try to discover how it grew, then figure out what you need. Of course, each person's despair is unique, and proceeds from a combination of individual life conditions, personal childhood, and past life experiences. As Ra said, know yourself, then accept yourself, which is a healing prescription to first know your history and feelings, and conditioned beliefs and patterns, then accept all these elements with love and self-tenderness, going beyond anger and blame. If you feel hopelessness, doom, impotence, or self-hatred, then you might need professional counseling help. Depression is usually the hardened product of years of non-loved dejection, and usually requires sustained self-work to fully heal. As for periodic discouragement, the treatment is simple and more direct, Take time for yourself, for rest, play, and self-nourishment. Work with any guilt that arises over saying no to more self-sacrifice, and be willing to sit with the pain of feeling unloved, unappreciated, or unsuccessful. Remember that all these feelings are normal, and furthermore, don't ignore the very real cycles of rest and activity. The fastest way to a goal is at your own pace, using both the brakes and your accelerator. Beyond all this advice, there are also deeper issues at work. Peering into the cavern of your own beliefs, do you find that you really expect to save the world? Do you think you can eliminate all the evil, selfishness, and ignorance around you? The basic question is simple. What are your expectations of your own life, both your service and your personal growth? With unrealistic expectations, we will always be discouraged. It's the common never-enough syndrome. With an unplugged leak in the vessel of self-esteem, you'll never be able to fill the cup of balanced self-appreciation. At the base of much long-term dejection live the shadows of self-doubt and old self-criticism. So, when is enough enough? Well, you cannot save the world, and neither can I. Only self can save the self. We can only help. And in closing, here's an idea to consider. The purpose of our 3D life is not the creation of utopian society. It's the offering of choice amidst confusion, allowing only those souls who strive the chance to grow into greater love and light. Humanity will be as it will be, but amidst the swirl, some souls are growing, 
All we can do is offer them useful catalyst in our own balanced way. Sharing your spiritual beliefs. Question. Some of my friends are curious about spirituality, but they seem more interested in arguing about what's real than really understanding my experiences. How should I deal with them? Answer. This kind of half-in, half-out approach is common when people feel an intuitive pull to a more spiritual perspective while still holding a rational materialist worldview. They yearn for the nectar of heart-knowing, yet they're still locked down by trust in intellectual logic. The most we can do is to sincerely, thoroughly, and reasonably present our experiences and beliefs and let our friends work out their own concerns through dialogue over time. If you see them longing to accept what you already realize as universal truths, though they are still fighting themselves, you can certainly tell them so. In the long run, the calling of soul always wins out, but that doesn't mean that some people will not enter the pearly gates kicking and screaming. The most we can do is answer their questions, understand their process, and be patient. This kind of non-interfering, caring but not forcing, is good training for us, too. Dreams and out-of-body experiences. Question. How can I know the difference between dreams and real out-of-body experiences? Answer. Active discernment and sensitivity to the quality of your experience is needed here. You can train yourself to learn to sense the difference in feeling between waking up from dreams as opposed to returning to your physical body from nighttime travel. A dream feeling is often more diffuse, like fantasy or imagination and far more self-circumscribed because it truly is subjective. To me, dreams feel like a movie in the head. On the other hand, a remembered OBE is usually fresh, vivid, and dynamic, mainly because it represents an objective interaction taking place at another level of being, simply recalled, and usually in fragments, much later. Without a doubt, some practice is needed to refine this discernment, and using a dream journal to record your experiences can help. The Doors of Perception Question. You use a quote from the poet William Blake, quote, If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to us or to man as it is, infinite, end quote. In your opinion, what does this mean? Answer. It's widely assumed among those who study mystery schools that Blake was an adept, an initiate who understood the greater mysteries to some extent. In this statement, the relationship between perception and experience is key. The fact that experience is determined by the quality of our awareness. What is seen depends on the viewer. The old phrase, for those with eyes to see, means that higher knowledge is self-selecting. You will not find it if you're not ready. And of course, the doors of perception that we normally use are none too clear. But more than just making a comment on the normal limits of human perception, Blake is really telling it like it is. The true nature of all things is totality and infinity. You may ask, how can this be when all I see are separated forms and feelings and thoughts and so on? The world in front of me certainly does not look infinite. Yet, that's just the point. According to mystery teachings and the experience of deep meditation, assuming that the world in front of us is all there is, is itself an illusion, because it's only the product of our six senses a narrowed sample of total potential knowing. Like Plato's statement that the physical world is a shadow of the world of true form, Blake says that human beings have far greater senses that can enable us to perceive far greater reality, if those senses are but awakened. As a mystic insight that is wholly subjective, current science cannot prove the existence of such higher senses, but according to Sears, what we assume to be the real world is but a single slice or frequency of an infinite reality, which can only be known through utter mental silence in a transpersonal, transcendental state of being, a universal vision in which there is no sense of separate self or personality. And by the way, clinical psychiatry would likely call it psychosis. Everyone who believes that they have had telepathic contact, out-of-body experience, past life recall, or a host of other paranormal events has had a glimpse of such higher perception. But isolated glimpses do not give us too much, and only through formal and regular meditation practice can we gather up these scattered gems and proceed along a path to pass through all veils forever. But don't worry, you will know when your higher centers are becoming more activated. 
you'll be able to more fully appreciate boundlessness, infinity, and the tangible sense of being at one with life. Sexuality and the Spiritual Path Question. The raw material said that their own ET race evolved on Venus and that they use sexuality as a main spiritual practice. Can you explain more? Answer. In Hindu and Buddhist traditions, there is a branch of teachings called Tantra, means rite or ritual from the Sanskrit, dealing with ceremonial magic or practice and energy direction. One element of this is sexual yoga, exercises, meditations, and ritual involving two partners in physical union. The idea is that higher consciousness can be achieved through sanctified sexuality, that is, conscious sexual embrace that aims to blend mind-body-spirit of each partner in divine worship and blissful union. We all know the power of orgasm upon awareness. It's no less than a taste of ecstasy. Ra indicated that enormous energy transfers can occur during sexual union. Love at the heart, wisdom at the throat, unity, forgiveness, and will at the third eye, and mystery, infinity at the crown. They said that when two souls are both on the path of service to others, then the gates to infinite intelligence or God consciousness can be opened by such practice. True tantric yoga is based on caring, respect, and unconditional freedom. Specific ritual movements actually are secondary. Happily, I think we'll soon see a return to such practices when Earth society becomes more balanced after harvest. In fourth density society, sexuality will at last return to the bosom of true, non-possessive love.